one, two more minutes. We are going to wait uh, to see, to celebrate uh, the World Food Safety Day. And to mark this day, we are launching a report that is very relevant to the topic of today, um, where we uh, commissioned by the International Livestock Research Institute, where we are looking into the um, current state and future directions of um, food safety in informal markets in low and middle income countries. My name is Sylvia Alonso. I'm a principal scientist at the International Livestock Research Institute, and I'll be your MC today. Um, so before getting started, let me give you some housekeeping rules for today. Feel free to use the chat to interact, to exchange, to comment, and to share um, with us. And maybe the first thing you can do is in the chat, please write, write your name and the institution that you represent. Use the Q&A, there is a Q&A icon, uh, where you can put any questions you may have for the panelists. We will have some time, hopefully, at the end of the panel to take on some of those questions, the participants in the webinar will have also a chance and will be monitoring the Q&A and, and responding as, uh, to the questions as, as we go along. And we'll try to answer as many um, questions as possible also after the, the event and sharing them with registered participants. Um, if you cannot hear or see, please um, uh, close the Zoom and sign in again um, to the meeting that should pro and solve the problem. Also, uh, please be aware that the session is being recorded and all the audio, video, and chat um, are keeping archived, and that includes all the private messages you may exchange in the chat. Hmm? Good, so with that, let me just take you through the program. We are going to spend the next um, one and a half hours um, talking about this report. Um, we'll have some opening remarks um, to launch the, the event. Then we'll have the um, report authors telling us about the content of the report, what is relevant about it, what are the findings, and what are those um, directions and recommendations that they have found um, in relation to fighting food safety in informal markets. After that, we are also going to illustrate some of those recommendations and findings in the report with um, actual research findings from research work that um, we've been conducting at ILRI over the past two decades on looking at interventions um, that can really improve food safety in informal markets in low middle income countries. Then we will have about uh, 40 minutes of a panel. We'll hear from people from different institutions. We want to know how this report resonates with their um, organizations, with their work on food safety, and what are the takeaways um, from the report? And at the very end, we just close. Um, we'll have closing remarks from Ilri. So with that, um, I want to, um, before we get into that, I'd like to open the floor to the opening remarks. I'd like to invite um, Apollinaire Dikan, um, Director General of the International Livestock Research Institute. Um, Apollinaire, over to you. I've um, Thank you, my colleagues. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which part of the world you're connecting from. I'm sending you greetings from Ilri, but I'm physically sitting here in Montpellier, the CGIR office here, where we have uh, we've just started the retreat of the agri food resilient the resilient agri food system science area. So this is an indication that we're in it as Ilri, but we also bring uh, the whole CGR uh, constituency behind us. I want to first of all thank all my Ilri colleagues and a range of partners who have made food safety um, an important body of our work for the past three decades. And let me also use the opportunity to thank the World Bank for joining us to do this. This is not the only thing that we've done together. We've done many things, but on this one, I'm delighted to be sitting on this chair here and thanking you as a previous ILRI employee. I witnessed many of the things that the institution did with the World Bank. And personally, taking this role, I'm committed that we can build on that strong foundation to do even more. 
And we are here celebrating the World Food uh, Safe today, but really I want us to celebrate the great work that we've done, you know, in trying to address some of these issues here. And this comes through some of the work that has uh, have taken place um, through the Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, uh, the consortium research program that uh, Delia was strongly involved and the ongoing One Health pro uh, program that Kung is involved. And these two uh, very talented colleagues represent a much bigger community within Ilri and a range of partners trying to do this. So what are the numbers when it comes to food safety? About 600 million people are aff affected. They are not sure whether the food that they receive on the table is safe for consumption. But as you know, many have to eat it, whether they are sure or not, they must eat it. It's really for us now to ensure that we have the incentive, the solutions for people who really have no other options to actually have access um, to food uh, safe for their consumption. Unfortunately, and very regrettably, up to half a million people still die every year in low and middle income countries for causes associated with food safety. And we're here demonstrating that at least we can move the needle to some extent. The overall cost is about 115 billion per year, economic cost, which is really remarkable. Imagine if we were to remove only half or best three quarters of this impact from our economic burden. I think a lot of that savings can help people to actually enjoy very good lives. And I think a lot of that <clears throat> falls within our hands. And we are starting from a very strong foundation based on the work that has been done in the past. What has ILRI done? You know, as I mentioned, many of the colleagues here have been involved in programs that have run for the past two, three decades. And currently the One Health program is really helping us to do that even more. And ILRI has also worked in creating initiative, uh, 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 approach um, incentives uh, through some of the innovations to ensure that the food producers themselves really have the knowledge and have the incentive to be really moving towards uh, the food which is safe for their own, cons uh, their own consumption, but also face at the, uh, safe at the marketplace. And that was done through an excellent work, uh, looking at the value chain, looking at some of the areas where we could be vulnerable. And you'll hear a lot of that uh, throughout this uh, um, uh, uh, book launch. And we also, through the work that we have done, recognize that informal markets are actually a considerable proportion of where the food comes from. If, if we can continue to focus on that, it will, you know, we will be able to, you know, uh, 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 generate uh, considerable gains. And about this report, the mission has been to improve, ILRI mission is really to improve food and nutritional security. And given the breadth of the depth of this work, the commission, the, this work was really commissioned to look at the informal sector, as I mentioned, in low and middle income countries. And the book is really offering us new direction for tackling food safety risk in the informal sector in developing countries and addresses some of the, provide some of the key recommendations that we can take on board. And more importantly, I want to single out that some of those recommendations will also be providing guidelines in terms of how new investment can come into the work that we are trying to do. The authors here, Stephen, Spencer, and many others, I really want to thank you for this. And we are going to hear much more from what you're saying here. Let me close by uh, thanking the funders who have provided us the necessary resources to do this work over the years. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the United States Agency for International Development, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Organization of the UK, the Australia Center for, Agriculture, for International Agricultural Research, and of course, the World Bank. I would, it would be remiss of me to finish this without thanking our excellent partners who have worked with us hand in hand in the countries where we have our footprint. Let me close here by thanking everybody who has been involved in this. And I'm looking forward to engaging this conversation that I hope will go beyond the one and a half hours that we have today. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to be part of this conversation.
Thank you, Apolina, for giving us those um, insightful remarks and, and really reminding us how this fits into the context of agricultural research um, in development in low and middle income countries. Right, so now we'll um, uh, give the floor to Julian Lampietti, Manager for Global Engagement, Agriculture and Food Global Practice at the World Bank. Um, welcome, Julian. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning to everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to World Food Safety Day. We're absolutely delighted to co-host this event, and particularly with Ilri, a longtime partner of the World Bank. Apollinaire, thank you for those nice words. And we are really, you know, longtime partners with the CGIAR. So this is very important for us to co-host this event today. And we have a massive challenge ahead of us. Apollinaire highlighted some of the numbers, 600 million people ill every year from foodborne disease, uh, you know, many more deaths. Now those numbers are from 2015, keep in mind. And a lot of people say that, uh, COVID-19 started in a food market and the importance of uh, those numbers has probably grown and the impact on our uh, economy, the global economy has grown significantly. And I, I think it's, it's really important to reflect that if we had better food safety, safety systems in place, we could have probably avoided or prevented a lot of what happened with COVID. So, uh, so please keep that in mind as you listen to today's talk. Um, no matter how you look at this problem related to food safety, uh, you know, it's producing large negative externalities and therefore there's a very strong case for public sector intervention and action here. That includes knowledge like we're gonna hear about today. It includes regulatory aspects. It includes investments in infrastructure and uh, many other things. Why do we have such a large informal sector in this space? You know, uh, there's many answers to that. One, of course, is that you have uh, 8 billion people that need to eat on the planet. And so they have to get their food from somewhere. And so you have markets everywhere. And uh, the urban space is growing really rapidly. And so we're getting a lot of this phenomenon occurring in urban space. The other is, you know, almost everyone knows how to cook in some way or another. And so, uh, you know, people can enter the food market very informally and at very low cost. So as you think about this problem, think about its vastness and its interconnectedness on everything we do. Now, a lot of people come to the World Bank and say, why are you not doing more on this particular issue of food safety? You guys invest all this, uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars in agriculture and food every year. So there's a couple of reasons. The first is that it's always important to remember the World Bank is demand driven as an institution. So our clients come to us and decide where they want to spend their money. And so our ability to do investments in food safety types of issues are really predicated on convincing them through knowledge that this is an important space to put their money. The second is, you know, particularly uh, informal markets and urban food safety issues fall between a lot of institutions in the kind of traditional frameworks that we deal with. Part of it is the Ministry of Agriculture, part of it is a food safety agency, and part of it, a lot of it is municipalities. And so I suspect to some degree, a lot of what we do in this space does not actually get counted because it's within these various groups and no one is actually checking a box saying we're doing it. Uh, I know also that in my own experience, and I've worked on a number of projects that have tried to upgrade uh, food safety systems in countries. One, there's lots of very difficult governance issues in this space. Two, um, the greatest success I've seen has been when you've got a lot of incentives associated with a very clear regulatory framework. And so those are the 
sticks and carrots that are described in this particular report, which I think is an excellent piece of work. And of course, you know, if we can get that framework right and we can get those incentives right, we can get our IFC colleagues to come into this space. One of the things we do and we continue to do is lots of advocacy. Uh, Stephen uh, was closely associated with that when he worked at the World Bank and produced an excellent report called the Food Safety Imperative. So I'm really delighted to see this work by Spencer, Stephen, and Shrove go forward uh, right now. Uh, for us going forward, we hope this draws a lot of attention from our countries and that we can use the One Health framework that is in place on pandemic prevention and preparedness to create investments. We have lots of up urban upgrading investments that could be brought to bear in this space. And of course, don't forget that the governments of the world are spending three quarters of a trillion dollars every year on incentives in agriculture and food, and that could be redirected some of the ways that they outline in this report. So with that, I'm very much looking forward to hearing the outcomes of today's uh, discussion and very much looking forward to our continued collaboration with the CGIR. Thank you all for participating and back to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Julian. And thank you also for illustrating so well the complexities and uh, of this massive and, and wicked problem but yeah, we are all looking forward to potential solutions and, and this is the perfect introduction now to our next speaker, because now is the time to, um, to present the report, um, New Direction for Tackling Food Safety Risks in the Informal Sector of Developing Countries. And we have one of the co-authors, Stephen Jaffe, um, who will take us through the content of the report in the main findings. Stephen is a lecturer at the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Maryland. Um, so welcome, um, Steve, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here on uh, World Food Safety Day. I'm gonna be presenting on behalf of uh, my, my co-authors, uh, Spencer Henson from the University of Guelph and Shua Wang from um, University of Maryland. Let me share my screen. And voila. Did it work? Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, you see, you're seeing you seeing the PowerPoint version or the just the uh... the outline. It's not in presentation mode yet. There we go. Yeah, that's oh. good. Okay. So uh, in, the, in this brief presentation, I'm going to um, uh, highlight the, the problem statement, uh, give you a taste of the perspectives that we offer uh, on, on the different subjects and outline the, the way forward as, as we see it. Um, you can get more details in the report. I'm going to be deliberately a bit uh, provocative uh, in the presentation in order to uh, and make you curious enough to want to read the report. Um, we very much thank uh, ILRI for their guidance uh, during uh, uh, the initiation and conduct of this work and in this organization of, of the event. When we began the work, we, we were looking for bridges. We were trying to see how do you link the sort of top-down um, food safety initiatives and the bottom-up food safety initiatives. Um, in the end, we found some bridges, but in, in some perhaps unexpected places. And I'll, and I'll make highlight some of that today. So first, uh, the sort of problem uh, statement. So if we, um, if we consider the, the, the food systems in developing countries, these are evolving quite quickly. Um, we, have, we tend to have a hybrid system, which combines larger players and closely coordinated value chains. Um, together with a plethora of, of micro and very small scale players. Um, yet food system fragmentation and informality really are the norm in, in still in most low and lower middle income countries. Um, and the overall predominance of smaller players and less formal channels is especially common when it comes to fresh produce, meat, fish, fruit and vegetables and also out of home eating, uh, particularly in, in cities. 
This has important ramifications for the incidence uh, and management of food safety risks in developing countries as these products are recognized as leading vectors uh, of foodborne disease. So uh, one of the starting points is, is, is looking at what, what's the state of play. Um, and so there are indeed uh, serious and widespread food safety issues in, in the informal sector. Uh, and over the past two decades, there have been many dozens, if not hundreds, of papers written that are based on uh, localized uh, surveys of traditional markets, informal food vendors, uh, workers involved in, in small companies. While the picture is not monolithic, it really points to widespread deficiencies in food safety awareness, in, in food handling and preparation practices, and the physical conditions under which the public markets operate and, and the, these, uh, these food actors operate. The literature also points to deficiencies in, in consumer uh, food safety awareness and the limited effectiveness of some of their strategies uh, to reduce their own exposure to food safety hazards. Other studies point to the high incidence and high levels of microbial, chemical, and other contaminants in foods, especially the fresh foods that are sold uh, in, these, in these markets and through these vendors. In the report, we provide, we provide some brief summary of this empirical literature. Um, and you know, this is sort of taking one example. This is from a study that was looking at a major uh, Asian city uh, where uh, community markets, uh, there's hundreds of community markets and they account for uh, the bulk of the consumer purchases. And let me just sort of quote quickly, uh, degradation is widespread, waste and wastewater collection and treatment does not meet the required capacity, supply of clean water is in, insufficient, risk of inundation and poor drainage is high, et cetera, et cetera. Meat has been sold, uh, has not been stored in, in cold containers leading to exposure to the environment. Uh, vendors leave fresh meat and processed ones next to each other. There's no record of product origin, et cetera. The infrastructure conditions and practices suggest a high risk of microorganism contamination, the fresh agricultural produce, mm -hmm. et cetera. Now, this commentary would really fit the description in community markets in many developing countries. Um, for in many places, these markets have fallen into disrepair, have not been substantially upgraded for decades, and resources have not been set aside or mobilized to do so. Okay, there are problems, but do small players and informal channels really contribute very much to the overall burden of foodborne disease in developing countries? Recent assessment work by the WHO and others has shed more statistical light on the overall incidence and public health burden of foodborne disease in different parts of the world. And in a recent World Bank study, we and other colleagues we put some dollar value on this, uh, on this burden, and attempt in an attempt to mobilize more public investment in domestic food safety. But how does the informal sector fit into this improved understanding of the overall public health and economic consequences of unsafe food? We couldn't find any estimates of this. So we 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 patched together, we based on various factors, and we came up with our own back of the envelope estimates, which are featured here in this table. The top part of the table sort of outlines the structure of food markets in, 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 in different uh, country types. And the bottom is the um, food, foodborne disease burden and what it's attributable. And really why the, the, the act, exact measure of this is going to vary from country to country. We estimate that for low and lower, lower middle income countries, that a large or very large majority of the burden of foodborne illness attributed to marketed foods uh, can be uh, attributed to the informal sector. Hence, unsafe food in informal distribution channels represents a central, not a peripheral, part of the food safety challenge facing developing countries. Okay, but you might ask, isn't this just a transitional issue? Isn't it one that will be addressed through ongoing processes of, of food system transformation 
and or regulatory oversight. Some countries we've certainly seen an increasing share of supermarkets and other modern retail formats, as well as increased um, investment by international fast food companies and the emergence of private food stand standards and, and food governance arrangements. Won't these larger players, this formalization process, this consolidation process and management systems crowd out the traditional players and lessen the significance of the informal sector food safety problem? We've also seen increasing resources going toward national food safety agencies and associated food testing, food business inspection services. Won't this enhance the centralized capacity for effective, be effective at addressing the informal food, food safety problem? With some exceptions, we believe the answer to both these questions is a resounding no. First, food system formalization is a long-term process. Traditional players and informal uh, channels will remain prominent for many years in processing and retail and food service. Second, many central government agencies have minimal contact with, let alone leverage over most traditional growers and small scale processors and vendors. As a result of dietary and demographic changes, we do expect almost a general escalation of food safety challenges, including in relation to the informal sector, as countries transition into and through lower middle income status with business as usual. Hence, this is a big problem. It may get bigger and it's not going away. So what are some perspectives that we offer uh, in, in the paper? First, conceptually, um, we try to tweak the sort of conceptually way of, of, of looking at the problem. We sort of unbundle it a little bit. Most commonly, the food safety problem is defined as either an awareness gap or a capacity, uh, a regulatory capacity gap, or both. Often the players involved in the developing country settings are, are cast as sort of as homogeneous. We provide a modified perspective. First, by defining the problem as a combination of limited capacity and weak incentives, and we consider a range of capacity and incentive types, both internal and external to the food operators. Sustained improvements are going to require concerted action, both in regard to incentives and capacity. We distinguish four different types of players and contrast their risk profiles and really the scope for policy interventions. That is, we distinguish between traditional kiosk operators, produce vendors in public markets, uh, micro scale food processors, and street food vendors and other uh, informal foods, uh, food service operators. They're different in terms of their product mix, their location, their licensing, their interface with consumers, and so they have a different risk profile. And the settings vary a lot. Low and middle income countries come in all shapes and sizes, being in various stages of demographic and food transformation. Transformation, having different administrative structures and, and resources available to them. Hence, we don't see this as a field where one size fits all or where the priorities or targeted players would be the same from place to place. So another part of the review looks at country experiences, trying to tackle food safety issues in the informal sector, including what we know about the efficacy. We look at some broad strategies and consider interventions and, that can be categorized either as capacity related or incentive related. We also look at insights in other fields where behavioral changes are needed and where informal players are, are particularly active things like traditional medicine, um, trash collection, brick making, some other fields. We found that very few of the food safety interventions really have applied a holistic vision on how the problems might be addressed. And few have sought to bring synergies across important objectives and interventions. An important exception to this seems to be playing out now in India, where its Eat Right India program has bundled together goals related to healthy eating, food safety, environmental sustainability, and they're employing an array of interventions trying to overcome the typical constraints faced in a hybrid food system 
populated by tens of millions of small players. They're applying a differentiated approach based on type of enterprise. For larger enterprises, it's the traditional regulatory enforcement approach. For small and medium enterprises, emphasis is on capacity building. And for micro and, and market players, the emphasis is on bundling uh, or clustering together on collective action amongst the players and improving site and services and the infrastructure side. The program looks very promising, yet we need to better understand what aspects are working better than others and, and what uh, challenges are being faced in implementation. So what's our overall assessment? First, we see important policy gaps. Very few countries have including, included the informal sector in their overall vision of national food system development or defined a coherent approach to this sector in their national food laws. Many see the informal sector as inconsistent with their notion of a competitive and resilient food system and inconsistent with their notion of modern city. Despite their importance for food and, and nutritional security, the upkeep of public or community markets has often been an area of neglect. Second, some interventions have probably been counterproductive. Official interactions with the sector often involve attempts to disrupt informal businesses or issue fines or other punishments due to non-compliance with this or that regulation. Third, some interventions have shown promising initial results, yet sustaining these gains has been difficult without follow-up or complementary follow-up efforts or complementary investments in infrastructure and in the overall enabling environment. This applies to many of the food safety training and awareness raising programs. Overall, there seems to be a lot of missed opportunity to leverage food safety interventions and systems with water and sanitation, nutrition, urban upgrading, or other better resourced programs. Where is action most needed or urgent? What countries most need to find effective ways to impact at scale food safety in the informal sector. We see these challenges being especially great and largely unresolved in most low and lower middle income countries. As these countries where the informal sector is most prominent, where dietary and demographic changes are most rapid, where there's a growing gap between food safety management needs and prevailing capacity, and where there is most uncertainty as to the tools which government can use. Also, in many of these countries, the attitudes towards the informal sector are either hostile or ambiguous, and very rarely very progressive. In the report, we draw attention to the comparatively much weaker institutional capacities for food safety management in lower, lower middle income countries. Also, the much wider set of constraints faced by cities, and especially small cities, in such countries to act on food safety matters. All right, so based on our reading of the scale and nature of the food safety problem and past interventions, we, pro we propose a modified strategy for making substantive and sustained progress. I will get to this in a, in a, in a second, but first three points of caution. First, we do not think that just devoting more resources to the current line of action will deliver much better results. Second, we think it's unlikely that the standalone topic of informal of food safety in the informal sector can mobilize sufficient policy attention and resources that's needed to actually obtain results at scale. Rather, the problem or the opportunity may, may, may need to be better paired with or seen as a leverage point for other better resourced developmental objectives and interventions. And third, we came away from our review somewhat humbled by the notion that addressing unsafe food in the informal sector is as much a political economy or governance issue as it is a technical issue. So what are the elements of the new direction strategy outlined in the report? It's based on three pillars or propositions. First, we don't believe that centralized agencies can deliver safer food in the informal sector. Primary interfaces between government and the informal food operators occur at the local level, especially involve municipal governments. Integrating the informal sector into national food safety laws would be desirable, 
Yet the more realistic mainstreaming can be done by including the informal sector and the growing number of strategies for healthy, sustainable, and resilient cities and incorporating them in urban plans and institutional arrangements or urban food governance. Municipal agencies and other decentralized units would need to play a dominant role in the engagement, support, and regulatory oversight of informal food operators when it comes to food safety. We realize that many cities are not currently well prepared to do so, but we don't see a al realistic alternative. And as with the broader urban food system agenda, we can't expect cities to act alone and to develop all the rules and programs themselves. National entities will need to ensure that cities have proper mandates, provide them with technical guidance, supplemental resources. Indeed, in the, in the, in the example, the implementation is being done at the state and municipal levels, but there's a very strong level of support and guidance coming from the center. Second, standalone food safety programs and projects may not be the most successful means of mobilizing and deploying resources. Rather, food safety initiatives could be better incorporated into other programs and synergies realized by combining attention to food safety with that for nutrition, animal health, environmental health, urban upgrading, or other prominent areas of action. And we can't, we can't achieve progress at scale targeting individuals. There's a need to better leverage collective action to address both capacity and incentive related problems. Hence, more attention be given to strengthening implementing programs through vendor, small business, and consumer organizations. Multi-stakeholder programs can play an important role. In hybrid food systems, involving diverse players, I think we face an enormous challenge of operationalizing the WHO's concept of shared responsibility between business consumers, government, and communities also. Multi-stakeholder platforms have been increasingly developed to address other urban food system issues like food waste, food logistics, protection of peri-urban uh, peri -urban agricultural land. Going forward, why not also in relation to food safety? Third and finally, we need to rebalance the mix of sticks and carrots in the interface between government and the informal sector. As low and lower middle income countries update their regulations and build their regulatory enforcement capacities, they should avoid the temptation to pursue a policing approach. Instead, they need to emphasize the promotion of good practice and sustained improvement. Inspectors should be rewarded not according to the businesses they shut down or food vendors they fund, but rather how many food operators become compliant with acceptable standards. At the same time, food safety enforcement should not be seen as a revenue stream for municipalities or indeed for the inspectors. Yes, there always be a need for enforcement when sustained poor food safety practices are observed. However, at least some municipal food safety officers should be deployed not as inspectors, but as extension agents, promoting and facilitating food safety improvements. Many locations adopting this approach will require a mindset change on the part of municipal managers and field officers. The report outlines a differentiated mix of priority interventions depending on the type of enterprise and the socioeconomic setting. This emphasizes our rejection of the one size fits all approach. In the short presentation, I can't go into the details, but in operationalizing this strategy, the devil really is in the details. In implementing this strategy, there's also going to be an important element of applied research. Much more work is needed to understand what works well, what works less well in different contexts terms of inducing the needed behavioral changes and in sequencing integrating different types of interventions. Insights from practice will need to be shared both among the food safety practitioner community and among the growing network of people working on broader urban food programs and governance. So I thank you very much. I look forward actually to the, the, the insights and, and commentary from our, our panel. The report, this has the link here, but otherwise Ilri will be sharing you that uh, link. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, that was um, a lovely overview and very challenging overview of such a long report. 
Um, and thank you for offering those three um, ideas and pillars for the way forward that you are proposing. And in fact, I'm sure that most of the, um, our participants have experience um, on food safety in informal markets. I'm sure they have their own views. Um, so it will be really good to hear uh, from you on the, on the chat, on the Q&A, um, if you want to share your own, your own experience. Um, and as you do that, and, and also following from Steve's call for the need for research, action research, that will really help us contextualize the solutions to the different uh, places, um, I'm really glad to be now giving the floor to Delia Grace, a professor at Food Safety Systems uh, Natural Resources Institute um, in the UK, and a joint appointed scientist at the International Livestock Research Institute. Delia has um, several decades of research in food safety in informal markets, so she, can, she will take us through her own experiences and findings through her research. Delia, over to you. Thank you. And, uh... I'm delighted to be here with everybody on World Food Safety Day and to see so many people have come to join us. I'll just share my screen and start a brief presentation, which is uh, reflecting on some of the past research of ILRI over the last few decades, and um, then looking forward to the, the next decades. So yes, so just quickly, I don't think at this stage, I don't think we need to spend too much time on what a serious problem food safety is. Many of us are aware of that. But when I started research uh, in 2000 uh, in Africa, food safety really wasn't on anyone's agenda. Nobody thought of food safety as being a really big development issue. And when it was thought of, it tended to be either on the farm, looking at things going on in the farm, or else very much thinking about export and could poor countries as the, in the same way as the Southeast Asian tigers exported their way out of poverty using technology, could Africa export its way out of poverty using food? In recent decades, that has changed dramatically. We are now fully aware of the huge burden of foodborne disease. The health impact is comparable to that of malaria, HIV, AIDS, or TB. This is coming from that uh, WHO study um, in which several of us were involved. And I should say that these are very, Firstly, they're out of date estimates that they were done nearly a decade ago. And also they are very conservative estimates. According to the WHO, one in 10 people in Africa fall ill each year from foodborne disease. But in countries where we've got pretty good data like Greece or like Greece or US, in those countries it's one in six or one in three. So certainly the food system in, in Africa is not much safer than the food system in Greek. Likewise, the economic burden is huge, more than a $110 billion a year, and most of this is coming from the domestic markets, not from trade, which is where most of the investments have been. In terms of the foods implicated, uh, it's the most risky foods are also the most nutritious foods, the foods we want people to consume more of, fish, meat, eggs, milk, vegetables. And most of these foods, these perishable nutritious produce are sold in the wet markets, traditional markets in low and middle income countries. And while much of this food is unsafe and, and this food is responsible for the greater burden of foodborne disease, these traditional markets offer many other advantages. Food is cheap, it's fresh, local breeds are featured, it's accessible. You can buy food in small amounts. It provides livelihoods for, for women and youth. So when we think of the Harms associated, the risks associated with wet markets, including spillover of disease and emergence of pandemics, we need also to think about the benefits these markets bring. So that was the sort of some of the motivation for conducting food safety research uh, at ILRI. And the, the program really only started in 2006 with backstopping from Cornell University. And at the first phase, when, as I said, there had been very little food safety research, and much of the research had not been in a food safety orientation, it had been in a hazard orientation, not in a risk orientation. So the first decade, there really was a focus on finding out, on diagnosis, uh, risk assessments, cost of illness, illness calculations, policy analysis, understanding risk factors. Then, from the middle of the last decade on, 
there started to be much more of a focus on interventions, risk management, what do we do? And in particular, what can be done that is affordable, effective, and will continue after the life of the project. And at this time too, there was increasing engagement with need regional, national IGOs, uh, including the African Union, who are speaking today, and um, ILRI co-led the food safety theme in action track one of the United Nations Food System Summit, which was a huge uh, process led by Lawrence Haddad overall in action track one. And the first time food safety got so much prominence in a UN process. So what have we learned? Well, we conducted uh, many food safety interventions in many value, different value chains. Here's just a picture of one uh, in Uganda, often working in multiple places along the fork, farm to fork pathway. And again, in the interest of time, I won't go into all the details, but just to give you a little bit of a flavor of, of what we were doing. Uh, these are some of the, the projects, typical projects conducted in Kenya, in India, a different one in Kenya, one in Nigeria, one in Senegal, uh, over a period of time, starting in 1997 up, up till 2015. You can see that the cost of the projects was often quite low. The lowest project cost was about $20,000, and the highest cost was several million. And yet with, with projects costing only tens of thousands of dollars, we could reach tens of thousands, hundreds to tens of thousands of traders. And in many cases, we were covering more than half of the traders or vendors in a given value chain in a given city or area. And this enabled us for, again, for costs of tens of thousands to reach hundreds of thousands to millions of consumers. So this is interesting because there was a lot of leverage. There was a lot of, of multiplication, in fact. We found that in an enabling environment, some of these projects didn't really look at the government authorities, or the municipal authorities, but more recently, some of them did. And then they started to have some policy influence. The interventions varied a lot, but they tended to have three, two essential components, one based on training and sometimes on simple technology, and then an incentive to try and find an incentive to change the architecture so that there was motivation for, for behavior change. And when we looked at the benefits, remember these projects all finished, the, the latest one finished in 2016. Um, but many of them were able to show substantial benefits, millions of dollars of ben benefits in Kenya and uh, India, where we actually did an economic study. And in other countries, we showed significant improvements in knowledge, attitude, practice, significant reduction in unacceptable meat and in food, food risk. And for very acceptable costs, the cost of training butchers in, in Nigeria were $9, and the gains through averted diarrhea were $800 per butcher. However, in many cases, once the project came to an end, uh, then activities came to an end. An exception was in um, India, where training and monitoring was supported by the government. So our key learning from the first phase, many interventions do not scale. Scaling must be thought about from the start, but we know the critical success factors for scaling. And we often need to change only a small number of behaviors to get quite a lot of impact. And these behaviors can be changed by incentives and nudges, and, but authorities must be on board. So that led us to the next stage in which we have been, um, we have what we call the three-legged stool. And by this, we, we believe and we hypothesize that food safety can be scalably and sustainably improved in informal markets if and only if three conditions are met. First, there must be incentives for behavior change. That is what we call the pull approach. There must be motivation for, for food safety actors to change. And secondly, there must be capacity for food safety actors to change, what we call the push approach. And that usually requires require some kind of informus, infor, uh, awareness raising, training technologies. And thirdly, there needs to be an enabling environment, which means the authorities must be on board and we must have more progressive ways of, uh, of regulating food safety. At the moment, we have nine projects going on or, or just finished, and we are trying to pull together the learnings of these to come up with 
strong, clear guidelines for different contexts, which people can use to improve food safety in informal markets. And here's just an example of one of our success stories. This is a time of, of great promise uh, where much has been done and much remains to do. And I would just draw attention to two really exciting things. One is the new food safety strategy for Africa, which has a very enlightened approach to food safety developed and endorsed by the African Union. And secondly, that we are now coming together, a small group of us to revive the UN coalition, coalition for Safe Food for All, which was so successful in bringing together many stakeholders around some game-changing solutions. So I think when it comes to food safety, the situation has never been brighter. And I'm looking forward to the next, working with you all for the next 10 years. Thank you, Delia. You have left us with such positive words, and it was really nice to see concrete examples of, of the action on the ground. Uh, well, with, so with that, um, we can move on to our panel time. Uh, we've actually put together a, a stellar panel. We have representations from um, five different organizations, national and international. Um, so without waiting any longer, We'd like to welcome and give the floor to Simone Moraes Brazo, scientist, multi-sectoral action in food systems from the World Health Organization. We are asking our panelists to tell us how the report and its content and messages really resonates with their organizations and the activities they may be doing. So, Simone, thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. Good day to everyone, uh, depending on the part of the world you are, and happy World Food Safety Day for those who are still on the 7th of June, some may be on 8th, but we are celebrating the, the week, the whole week with uh, events. Thanks for inviting me to this panel and to have the opportunity to, to read the report and to um, analyze um, and probably to incorporate uh, the recommendations in our actions. Um, the report brings a very interesting analysis on the issue of food safety in informal markets uh, and vendors in low and middle income countries. I totally agree that um, we need to have coherent strategies for tackling food safety risks in informal sector. And we need to consider that each context will require a specific solution. Um, I think to find potential solutions or to identify the best approach, it's necessary to map informal markets and vendors, understand food consumption patterns. Uh, Delia also mentioned about the importance of consumer behavior change uh, and involve them, um, also the small scale producers. We also need to consider two additional aspects that I think are very important. Uh, regarding the consumer's perspective, I think it's very important to understand why consumers choose to buy from informal market or vendors. Um, the answer may be not the same for all the countries, and it needs to be taken into consideration when establishing strategies. For example, uh, why a consumer wants to go to a market to choose a live uh, chicken to be slaughtered in the market and bring that to home. Um, what drives this behavior? It's a culture, it's um, something that uh, uh, the mom and the grandmom always did, uh, or because they don't trust an inspection service in the counter. What's behind this, this behavior? If we don't understand that, we will not be able to, to define the strategies. Another aspect that I think it's very important to consider is that um, the whole of the woman in the in the food markets. Why, if you go to a food market, most of the vendors you will find will be human. Why women choose to be in the informality um, or why they are driven to be to the informality? So when we think about um, solutions for food from the food market perspective, we need to think about um, those aspects. And when we think about infrastructure that was mentioned by the World Bank colleague, we also need to think about 
why humans are there, maybe because they don't have a child care center to let their kids, or because they don't have schools. So they, they need to be in the informality because they can't take a formal job, because they don't have where to let the kids, or they don't have someone to take care of the kids. And how exposed are the kids as well to the risks in public markets? So I think we need to have a more holistic approach, consider also aspects that goes beyond food safety infrastructure. And that is, is also important for that. In WHO, we, we do recognize the public health issues in informal markets. And um, we, we are working on that. And besides food safety, we are also considering the other aspects related to the animal interface that happens in food markets. Uh, we need to consider also the exposure to live animals in the food markets. And this, is, this happens uh, with a frequency. We know that it's not only a food safety issue, but it's a public health issue that we need to consider. We can't only uh, focus on food safety if we're not also tackling um, other uh, sources of risks to consumers um, and to vendors. It's uh, mainly occupational risks that we also need to consider. In this regard, uh, during the pandemic, WHO published an interim guidance on to reduce public health associated with public, uh, sales of wildlife in traditional food markets. Um, this document is now to be updated. We had a call uh, for experts. We are about to start the discussion and uh, to extend the scope of the document. The document was focusing on mammalian species, wild, live wild mammalian species in food markets. Uh, we are now considering the extension of the scope, um, turning it, it into a really a, a document, not an interim guidance, but into a guidance with uh, recommendations based on scientific evidence and on um, the advice from the experts that will be part of this uh, develop, guidance development group. So I think the report published uh, by IRI will also be an important background document to be incorporated in the discussion for sure. Uh, I think it's very helpful and uh, will be sure uh, take a lot of advantage from the work you have done so far. Uh, also, my last comment, it's about the global strategy for food safety. Um, the strategy aims to strengthen food control systems and a food control system also needs to recognize informal sectors. Um, although it's, uh, when you talk about enforcement and the, the sticks, it's a little bit more hard, but uh, the, the call for, a stake, for engaging stakeholders uh, that is in the one of the uh, strategic priorities of the strategy. Uh, we'll also consider food markets and uh, we recognize the need to involve local markets. I totally agree that this is a local um, a topic that needs to be addressed locally. Uh, and although it's a little uh, more complex to involve uh, local governments, we need to address that. And that is for sure included in the strategy when we mention about uh, involving all stakeholders. It also means involving all levels of governments and empowering um, local governments to um, intervene and to uh, promote healthier food markets. Um, I will stop here and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simone. Thanks for those um, nice insights and, and how that relates to how you see this uh, from your perspective and your organization. All right, let me now um, give the floor to Marcus Lip, Senior Food Safety Officer at the Food and Agricultural, Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Uh, Marcus? Um, Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Happy Food Safety, World Food Safety Day to everybody, also from FAO, of course. Uh, it's uh, our delight and pleasure to celebrate today World Food Safety, well, 7th of June, like Simone said, for some it was yesterday. Um, so, yeah, it's great to be here. And uh, let me start with uh, my compliments or my appreciation to both the authors of that report and to Ilvi for funding it or driving it. 
I think it's really, really fantastic that a, a very comprehensive and systematic approach to informal markets has been um, achieved or, or published here uh, because it will shape the discussions going forward. So for, from my FAO perspective, uh, the agri-food system is incredibly complicated, as we all know. Um, it's not just the social dynamic, because like Apollinaire said already, everybody is a food expert anyway. Everybody knows about food. There's there's no consumer product that is as as emotional and as, as important cultural and as important from an identity perspective than there is food. So everybody knows everything about food, and uh, or at least enough to... to uh, well, um, maintain that they know how to deal with food. And that makes the discussion very complicated because it gets immediately very personal if there's behavioral changes that are required. Not impossible, but complicated. Now, also, Apollina mentioned that already. Uh, it is, from a regulatory perspective or from an institutional perspective, incredibly complicated. There's the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Agriculture, but also trade and tourism and a couple of other ministries. There's municipalities, there is federal governments, and that depends on the country how exactly it looks. And everybody wants to have a piece of the pie in food safety or claim some responsibility, rightly so. Again, complicating the picture. And informal markets are part of the agri-food system. They, they have always been a part of the agri-food system and they will stay there for quite some time to come because they're so important in terms of food availability and in terms of economic options for the, the participants there. Now, then we come to the approach of how can we do better? And of course, the, the immediate claim uh, or immediate requirement is, okay, we need to uh, strengthen the institutional capabilities to, for food safety, but it will also needs to be matched by strengthened capabilities able to keep pace with that. And on top of it, then there is this problem, is the consumer even willing to pay? So hence we have the whole consumer awareness and, and discussion around that. And that has all already been discussed. So we, we appreciate this report for its nuanced discussion and for its comprehensive discussion about all these different aspects um, that, that go into the informal system and, and what that means, because we have been, I think carelessly, oh, not all of us naturally, but many publications have been carelessly just speaking about, at the best case, traditional markets. At the worst case, it was just wet, wet markets, which is pretty stigmatized ever since the pandemic, of course. Um, and, and that's not fair because there are so many graduations. There are so many differences, local differences. So it is not one size fits all. It cannot be that one size fits all. It, it, there has been enough publication, even in, in willingness to pay studies, uh, that, that make it clear that it, it needs to be a more nuanced approach. Delia had made, given great examples there that, that need to be adapted to the local environment. And uh, again, circling back on the report, I feel or we believe that this report gives us the language and, and gives us the framework, the intellectual framework, if you want, to continue the discussion to continue to fine tune our discussions, to expand our discussions, and to build on, on this with interventions that hopefully improve food safety for everybody, because that's the ultimate goal for everybody. Um, at least also from an FAO perspective, there's food security is uh, eliminating hunger, the main driving goal for FAO, but it has been realized for a long time that there cannot be food security if there is no food safety. So we need to uh, improve food safety with all, but that comes with all the complexities I, I uh, in, uh, alluded to, and of course was much better uh, illustrated by, by previous speakers. So uh, to summarize, I, I think it's a fantastic piece of work um, and, and my appreciation again for, to Steve and to Spencer and to, to Ilri for, for financing and, and creating this body of work. Uh, I think it will be instrumental as, as a, a foundation or an anchor block where we can all come back to and, and develop um, additional interventions, additional frameworks on top of it, because we have this common language that this support provides. I'll stop here, but thank you so much. Thank you, Marcus. Um...
Right, our next panelist is um, Amare Ayaleo, Program Manager and a Partnership for Aflatoxin Control in Africa, PACA, at the African Union Commission. Um, welcome, Amare, and thank you for being with us. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. Uh, also, thank you very much for having me. First of all, uh, I would like to start by congratulating Ilri and uh, the authors for producing this uh, influential and uh, very practical work. Uh, a lot of careful review and uh, also quality thinking has gone into it. Uh, in the food space, informal markets uh, have been the elephant in the room. Uh, so we are really happy to see this work uh, at this time. Over the years, uh, we have seen some efforts to draw attention to the informal sector. And uh, we also have come to understand that uh, policing individuals in the informal sector won't work. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, this is the first work with uh, a very good uh, conceptual framework as well as practical uh, options to lift food safety in the in the informal sector. Uh, let me uh, let me highlight very few uh, takeaways from this uh, work. Uh, I had the opportunity to read it, uh, which I enjoyed. First of all, uh, based on evidence, this work the authors have shown that uh, the informal food sector is there to to stay, uh, it will be with us. The supermarket penetration is not going to uh, displace it anytime soon. So we have to deal with it. I think this is a very important, uh, a very important point. Uh, also coming with a strong evidence. Secondly, uh, the work emphasized a lot that uh, the informal sector is not homogeneous. Also, Steve uh, emphasized that during his short uh, presentation. And uh, also the authors have tried to come up with some categories of the informal sector, which in my opinion will be very useful uh, to package the right interventions. And also I think the emphasis uh, on, uh, I am sorry, if my power is out, I will have to, to stop where, uh, where it will take me. So I think the other thing is, um, also, the emphasis to address uh, this uh, deficit uh, system deficits politically, I think that's also a very important point. Maybe in what could be considered to uh, to improve it, one area might be, uh, for the most part, this report uh, recognizes the central role of uh, governments. Uh, but uh, I think around the recommendations in the ways forward, uh, I think the the point that uh, there is a lot of emphasis on, uh, on fi financing food controls, uh, national food controls is probably a little bit, uh, a little bit. Right, right. Uh, it seems that um, the battery of his computer died. He actually alerted me to that. Um, we will have him back if he manages to plug in his computer, but I think we can now move on and will not welcome our next panelist, um, Pawan Agarwal, Chief Executive Officer, Food Future Foundation, and the former Chief Executive Officer at the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. Um, Pawan, uh, thank you for being with us. Over to you. Let me first of all extend my greetings to all of you on the occasion of the World Food Safety Day and also congratulate uh, Steve and Spencer for this very timely report on food safety in the informal markets that was in some sense a key finding uh, or key recommendation that came out of uh, almost two year deliberations during the UN Food System Summit uh, that uh, I, along with uh, Delia, had, uh, you know, an opportunity to lead and, you know, deliberate over 
almost 18 to 24 months with experts in this particular field. You know, if I clearly remember, I know that, uh, uh, you know, food safety and foodborne illnesses, uh, over 90, 95% of them are in the low and middle income countries and that too predominantly from the informal markets. So therefore, it is extremely timely, uh, you know, for this report. And thank you, Steve, for making reference to the work that uh, uh, was done in India and that is being done in India. So as far as, uh, you know, in my brief remarks on this occasion, I'll not really uh, elaborate further on what uh, has already been stated by Steve, but maybe touch upon a few points that were not covered in, uh, you know, uh, in what Steve mentioned about Eat Right India movement and our, you know, focus on informal markets. Uh, let me begin with the origin of uh, our thinking, you know. So uh, when I was uh, assigned this responsibility in the government in India uh, to look after the Food Safety Authority in uh, early part of 2016, and so I had occasion to visit Europe and America, and uh, I found that uh, the, uh, the, the regulatory tools that are used in these countries uh, would not work in India because, uh, you know, we found that uh, the nature of food system in India is very different from what, uh, uh, you know, exists in my own country and we have to find solutions for that. And we immediately got down to doing something very differently than aping the West on food safety in India and came out with very simple solutions to it even though we had a legislation, which in some sense was uh, uh, a lot inspired by food safety regulations in uh, Europe. But in application of those laws, we thought there is a leeway of doing something very differently than what is normally done to address food safety concerns. And one of them was uh, a differentiated, or we call it graded approach, which I think Steve mentioned very clearly, uh, that uh, we found that even though food standards, same food standards will apply to the formal and informal market, but when we apply it to the informal market, we could focus on empowerment of the consumers, you know, a, a big focus on changing the culture and demand, creating demand for safe food from the consumers. That was one thrust area for us. And second thrust area was building capacity. I think these two Cs, culture and capacity, was what Delia mentioned in her brief remarks. So this is the approach that we took. Uh, second is, as rightly pointed out, that informal markets are very complex. And India is a large country, and therefore, it is even more complex. So we thought that uh, if it is complex, how do we address it? So we have to slice it in small bits so that each bit is simple. And therefore, we looked at informal markets through the lens of simplicity and uh, created very simple checklists, you know, and those checklists were even presented and displayed in the premises of these people so that it continues to remind them that these are 10 things or 12 things that they are supposed to be doing, you know, and it also helped the regulatory staff in inspections, et cetera. So I think simplification of the regulatory systems was very, very important to ensure its applicability uh, to the informal markets. Because if we use the same instruments that are used in advanced countries for formal markets, for ensuring food safety in informal markets, it will obviously make food very expensive. And I don't think that will work. So this is the second thing. Third is huge focus on capacity and training building. Today, India has one of the biggest training ecosystem for food safety. Over 1 million food safety supervisors have been trained, and there are about 200 or more, you know, training providers that are, you know, uh, you know, working to provide that training. So all that training ecosystem is, in fact, in some kind of a public-private partnership. The fourth area is hygiene rating, or even cluster third-party certifications. Because whether food safety is being maintained or not maintained, somebody has to go and check it. You know, we cannot really rely on these small and petty businesses. And that is where 
you know, uh, we came in with whole idea of third party uh, audits and certification. The problem was there were not too many agencies who could handle this job. And therefore we came out with some kind of, uh, we call it hygiene mitra, you know, professionals who have some basic training and education in food and uh, food and train them to, you know, go and inspect whether those few things that are on the checklist are being followed or not and give them a little more training on food safety risks, etc. So hygiene rating and third party certification at scale, what was adopted and there, uh, you know, there are about half a million businesses that have been hygiene rated, clusters have been covered under this. Fifth is that how do we engage, you know, IEC and we adopted a very innovative approach, which we call as triple E, engage, excite. You know, I think our businesses should be excited about doing the right things. And unless they're excited, you know, they will not do those things. So excitement was very important part of the whole process of change. And finally, enable them to bring about that change. You know, so the capacity building, but also work with them in case they uh, are not able to do it, help them to do it, you know. So triple E approach is what we adopted. Sixth point was around combined food safety with nutrition and sustainability. We found that in amongst the policymakers and various people, you know, food safety is not high on their agenda. Maybe sustainability is, maybe, uh, you know, nutrition is. So we brought under Eat Right Movement, all the three elements together, and they were small bits. And uh, in fact, as uh, I think uh, Steve mentioned, or Delia also mentioned, that, uh, you know, some of the uh, most nutritious food, like fruits and vegetables, dairy, is also, or has the highest food safety risks. So I think uh, combining these three elements was very important to bring excitement and to get everyone on board. And finally, recognition and reward. A very strong recognition and reward system. And when this was not really cash incentives. They were not huge money spent on it. Today, I can say that uh, I have left the organization about two and a half years ago. And uh, all those initiatives are only grown by scale. About one fifth of the country is currently covered. And our objective was not to cover the whole country in one go. It is a large country. So we wanted that administrations, local administrations, the, in India, we have a strong district authorities, which also have some kind of a oversight control on the municipal authorities. So if they come forward and say that we take responsibility of food safety in our own areas, I think it is very, very important. So recognition and reward. And I think uh, now wonderful things are happening across the country. In fact, one of the cities in India, Rao Kela, is being awarded the Milan Pact Award you know, next week. And uh, they have done some very interesting stuff covering a very large city about uh, you know, about a million and a half population um, uh, to, to address food safety issues in a very comprehensive, food safety and nutrition issues in a very comprehensive manner. So these are innovative approaches that uh, India is adopting. I think uh, uh, I have all reason to believe that uh, uh, I think food safety, because it is primarily an informal market issue, there is a need for global agencies to look at food safety with a fresh lens. And this report provides that opportunity for global agencies to look at uh, food safety with that fresh lens. Thank you very much for the opportunity that you gave me. Thank you, Pawan. And it's so nice to see a, a real concrete example of how these recommendations are already being implemented and what effect they are having on, on food safety in the FUMA market. Right, um, last but definitely not least, our uh, fifth panelist, Nika Larian, Food Loss and Waste Advisor, Center for Nutrition at the United States Agency for International Development, Bureau for Resilience and Food, Se Food Security. Um, thank you, Nika, for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me to celebrate the launch of this report. I want to start by applauding the report's call to action and ILRI's updated research that informs our programmatic approach to food safety, which includes informal markets. At USAID, we are focused on expanding local consumer access to and affordability of safe, nutritious food 
To improve diets through Feed the Future, the U.S. government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative led by USAID. The USAID Food Safety Division manages a diverse portfolio of partners, and collectively, we are exploring ways to improve the enabling environment for food safety in different parts of the food system, including local food systems. Informal or traditional markets have become an important research focus at USAID, and this is an important step in the right direction. As others have mentioned as recently as a few years ago, food safety wasn't the development imperative it is today. It's clear that safer traditional markets are a critical access point to nutritious food, particularly in areas already vulnerable to malnutrition and food insecurity. When consumers across the African continent access over 80% of their food from informal markets, action and investment become critical so that access to safe, nutritious food is maintained even in the face of shocks and stressors, such as the global food crisis and climate change. USAID is exploring how to build the demand for food safety among consumers and vendors in traditional markets. We're doing this specifically through the Feed the Future program called Evidence and Action Towards Safe, Nutritious Foods, or Eat Safe. In Nigeria, Eat Safe is implementing four country-specific interventions that seek to increase consumer demand for and vendor capacity to provide safe food as informed by Eat Safe's formative research to better understand the cultural environment and individuals' preferences, behaviors, and beliefs regarding food safety. I want to highlight Eat Safe because of its focus on both incentives and capacity. And I was constantly reminded of Eat Safe while reading through the report's recommended balancing of carrots and sticks. First, to create incentives for food safety, Eat Safe focused on creating a regulatory system which rewards and places social pressure to improve food safety practices. To do this, Eat Safe established the Association for Promotion of Food Safety and Improved Nutrition, or AFSAN, to convene a group of market actors and stakeholders via a Nigerian government registered association to advocate for improved food safety. Additionally, to improve food safety practices in traditional markets, the Abinsi Fest Fest Safe Food brand provides in-market visual cues to inform consumers which vendors are implementing food safety best practices through training and an opt-in brand program. Secondly, in addition to capacity building through vendor training, Eat Safe raises awareness and supports food safety education through the Seya Nagari radio show which produces weekly episodes with influential on-air personalities, call-in sessions, and scripted dramas with 700,000 listeners. And lastly, the Safe Food Market Stand provides a physical space in the market where consumers can access food safety information while they shop. As such, USA Food Safety Programming takes a context-driven, multi-sectoral approach and supports research to help us understand which interventions are most effective throughout the food safety life cycle. Therefore, we applaud the evidence and call to action put forward by this report. Thank you and happy World Food Safety Day. Thank you, sorry, I lost my screen for a second. Thank you, Nika. Uh, for your um, nice remarks, for reminding us of additional work happening in this sphere, of the research, uh, it's a project and others to which this report really contributes to and into that evidence-based. Well, so that brings us to the end of the, of the panel. As usual, time always goes fast and the one wants. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time to take any questions uh, to the panelists, uh, but please, uh, write your questions, and I can see the, in the Q&A there's already some questions. Um, the panelists and the um, authors of the report will answer to all the questions, and we will circulate that after the meeting. With this, I'd like to move on to the closing remarks, and for that, I'd like to invite um, Hung Guya, um, who is the program leader of the Animal and Human Health uh, Program at ILRI. Hung, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sylvia. 
uh, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to say happy, happy uh, World Food Safety Day as well uh, to all of you. So, and thank you very much. Over 150 uh, participants of this webinar from different countries, different sectors. This shows us the interest of food safety is, is very important for, for this day. Uh, okay, so I will be very brief uh, by saying that I'm very happy to see this uh, rich discussion around the launch of this report. Uh, the report is very important uh, work made by uh, Stephen uh, Spencer and, and Huang. Thank you very much uh, for the effort. And it reminds me our discussion uh, uh, some times ago together with Delia, who was leading food safety at CGIR, but also our dear colleague, John Mark Dagmuth from IPRI, leading the uh, CGIR uh, program on our new, uh, agriculture for nutrition and health. So we discussed the framework of this report, and I'm very happy to have it launched today at the World Food Safety Day, showing the review of the updated evidence on uh, the food safety in informal and traditional or wet market in low and middle income countries. I think that it's a very good body of knowledge put together by uh, Steve and his colleagues, but more importantly, addressing the way forward and options to really improve food safety in these difficult conditions. I'm also very happy to I have the comment uh, from different colleagues and friends and partners, in particular WHO, FAO, African Union, USAID, and so on. And I just want to say that, of course, you know, you, uh, all the speaker and uh, 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 panelists didn't say, didn't refer to the One Health framework. The food safety is really a major pillar of the One Health concept that now all the organizations refer to. And of course, uh, in the framework of quadripartite, including our colleague here, Simone from WSO, but also FAO, OIE, and UNEP, they came up with the new definition or updated definition of One Health and also the new action plan to address this quadripartite. And happily to see also that food safety is one of the five or six pillars of this uh, joint action plan of quadripartite to implement. One Health. So you see, uh, this is very important to address food safety, in particular food safety in informal uh, market in low and middle income countries. And I think that the discussion today uh, offers the opportunity to reflect, but more importantly, to really tackle on the field in terms of intervention. Because for me, we know enough the risk posed by foodborne disease from informal market. And the important thing is now all together we join hand to address, to make interventions on the ground. And of course, you know, the recommendation of Steve and Spencer and Wang, uh, sometimes it's very uh, uh, provocative, like he said from the beginning, but it gives opp opportunity to refer also to our own research in terms of intervention on the ground to meet something in the middle, to come up with a good strategy to improve food safety in traditional market in low and middle income countries. And I hope that you know, the remark from Amare from African Union and also Simone with the two um, food safety strategies strategy recently published from Africa, but also at global level, will be the framework so that we can work together. We serve you and also we collaborate with you from research side uh, to work in the uh, context of CJR. So we have one health initiative of one CJR, but also many as a project on food safety and money effort in different countries to uh, improve food safety worldwide. So thank you very much. I would like to thank you very much all of you for the participation. And in particular, thank you the authors, but also Cynthia, my colleague who have uh, moderated very well this session and wish you all the best and have the safe food because if you don't have safe food, so we don't have food security. So thank you very much. And again, happy World Food Safety Day 2023. Over to thank you. you Han. Um, thank you for the closing remarks. So with that, um, the only thing that remains for me to say is thank you all participants for, for your contributions, for listening in. Um, we've noticed there's quite a number of questions in the Q&A. We'll take care of those um, at the end of 
um, of the meeting. When the recording is available, we will be emailing everyone who registered for the for the webinar. We'll share the recording and we will share um, answers to the questions that were unanswered um, today. And we'll share uh, links to the report and other resources. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of the day. Bye.